Letter the Sixth of Leslie Castle by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Leslie Castle, Letter the Sixth, Lady Leslie to Miss Charlotte Luterell. Leslie Castle, March twentieth. We arrived here, my sweet friend, about a fortnight ago, and I already heartily repent that I ever left our charming house in Portman Square for such a dismal old weather-beaten castle as this. You can form no idea sufficiently hideous of its dungeon-like form. It is actually perched upon a rock to appearance so totally inaccessible that I expected to have been pulled up by a rope, and sincerely repented having gratified my curiosity to behold my daughters at the expense of being obliged to enter their prison in so dangerous and ridiculous a manner. But as soon as I once found myself safely arrived in the inside of this tremendous building, I comforted myself with the hope of having my spirits revived by the sight of two beautiful girls, such as the Miss Leslies had been represented to me at Edinburgh. But here again I met with nothing but disappointment and surprise. Matilda and Margaret Leslie are two great, tall, out-of-the-way, overgrown girls, just of a proper size to inhabit a castle almost as large in comparison as themselves. I wish, my dear Charlotte, that you could but behold these Scotch giants. I am sure they would frighten you out of your wits. They will do very well as foils to myself, so I have invited them to accompany me to London, where I hope to be in the course of a fortnight. Besides these two fair damsels, I found a little humoured brat here who I believe is some relation to them. They told me who she was, and gave me a long rigmarole story of her father and a Miss Somebody, which I have entirely forgot. I hate scandal and detest children. I have been plagued ever since I came here with tiresome visits from a parcel of Scotch wretches, with terrible hard names. They were so civil, gave me so many invitations, and talked of coming again so soon that I could not help affronting them. I suppose I shall not see them any more, and yet, as a family party, we are so stupid that I do not know what to do with myself. These girls have no music but Scotch airs, no drawings but Scotch mountains, and no books but Scotch poems, and I hate everything Scotch. In general, I can spend half the day at my toilet with a great deal of pleasure, but why should I dress here since there is not a creature in the house whom I have any wish to please? I have just had a conversation with my brother, in which he has greatly offended me, and which, as I have nothing more entertaining to send you, I will give you the particulars of. You must know that I have, for these four or five days past, strongly suspected William of entertaining a partiality to my eldest daughter. I own, indeed, that had I been inclined to fall in love with any woman, I should not have made the choice of Matilda Leslie for the object of my passion, for there is nothing I hate so much as a tall woman, but, however, there is no accounting for some men's taste, and as William is himself nearly six feet high, it is not wonderful that he should be partial to that height. Now, as I have a very great affection for my brother, and should be extremely sorry to see him unhappy, which I suppose he means to be if he cannot marry Matilda, as, moreover, I know that his circumstances will not allow him to marry any one without a fortune, and that Matilda's is entirely dependent on her father, who will neither have his own inclination nor my permission to give her anything at present, I thought it would be doing a good-natured action by my brother to let him know as much, in order that he might choose for himself whether to conquer his passion or love and despair." Accordingly, finding myself this morning alone with him in one of the horrid old rooms of this castle, I opened the cause to him in the following manner. Well, my dear William, what do you think of these girls? For my part, I do not find them so plain as I expected, but perhaps you may think me partial to the daughters of my husband, and perhaps you are right. They are indeed so very like Sir George that it is natural to think. My dear Susan, cried he in a tone of the greatest amazement, you do not really think they bear the least resemblance to their father. He is so very plain. But, I beg your pardon, I had entirely forgotten to whom I was speaking. Oh, pray don't mind me, replied I. Everyone knows Sir George is horribly ugly, and I assure you I always thought him a fright. You surprise me extremely, answered William. By what you say, both with respect to Sir George and his daughters, you cannot think your husband so deficient in personal charms as you speak of. 
nor can you surely see any resemblance between him and the Miss Leslies, who are, in my opinion, perfectly unlike him and perfectly handsome. If that is your opinion with regard to the girls, it certainly is no proof of their father's beauty, for if they are perfectly unlike him, and very handsome at the same time, it is natural to suppose that he is very plain. By no means, said he, for what may be pretty in a woman may be very unpleasing in a man. But you yourself, replied I, but a few minutes ago allowed him to be very plain. Men are no judges of beauty in their own sex, said he. Neither men nor women can think Sir George tolerable. Well, well, said he. We will not dispute about his beauty, but your opinion of his daughters is surely very singular, for if I understood you right, you said you did not find them so plain as you expected to do. Why do you find them plainer, then? said I. I can scarcely believe you to be serious, returned he, when you speak of their persons in so extraordinary a manner. Do not you think the Miss Leslies are two very handsome young women? Lord, no, cried I, I think them terribly plain. Plain? replied he. My dear Susan, you cannot really think so. Why, what single feature in the face of either of them can you possibly find fault with? Oh, trust me for that, replied I. Come, I will begin with the eldest, with Matilda. Shall I, William? I looked as cunning as I could when I said it in order to shame him. They are so much alike, said he, that I should suppose the faults of one would be the faults of both. Well, then, in the first place, they are both so horribly tall. They are taller than you are indeed, said he with a saucy smile. Nay, said I, I know nothing of that. Well, but, he continued, though they may be above the common size, their figures are perfectly elegant, and as to their faces, their eyes are beautiful. I never can think such tremendous knock-me-down figures in the least degree elegant, and as for their eyes, they are so tall that I could never strain my neck enough to look at them. Nay, replied he, I know not whether you may not be in the right in not attempting it, for perhaps they might dazzle you with their lustre. Oh, certainly, said I with the greatest complacency, for I assure you, my dearest Charlotte, I was not in the least offended, though by what followed one would suppose that William was conscious of having given me just cause to be so. For coming up to me and taking my hand, he said, You must not look so grave, Susan. You will make me fear that I have offended you. Offended me? Dear brother, how came such a thought in your head? returned I. No, really, I assure you that I am not in the least surprised at your being so warm an advocate for the beauty of these girls. Well, but... Interrupted William. Remember that we have not yet concluded our dispute concerning them. What fault do you find with their complexion? They are so horridly pale. They have always a little colour, and after any exercise it is considerably heightened. Yes, but if there should ever happen to be any rain in this part of the world, they will never be able to raise more than their common stock. Except, indeed, they amuse themselves with running up and down these horrid old galleries and antechambers. Well, replied my brother in a tone of vexation, and glancing an impertinent look at me. If they have but little colour... At least it is all their own. This was too much, my dear Charlotte, for I am certain that he had the impudence by that look of pretending to suspect the reality of mine. But you, I am sure, will vindicate my character whenever you may hear it so cruelly aspersed, for you can witness how often I have protested against wearing rouge, and how much I always told you I disliked it, and I assure you that my opinions are still the same. Well, not bearing to be so suspected by my brother, I left the room immediately, and have been ever since in my own dressing-room writing to you. What a long letter have I made of it! But you must not expect to receive such from me when I get to town, for it is only at Leslie Castle that one has time to write even to a Charlotte Lettero. I was so much vexed by William's glance that I could not summon patience enough to stay and give him that advice respecting his attachment to Matilda, which had first induced me from pure love to him to begin the conversation, 
and I am now so thoroughly convinced by it of his violent passion for her, that I am certain he would never hear reason on the subject, and I shall therefore give myself no more trouble, either about him or his favorite. Adieu, my dear girl, yours affectionately, Susan L. End of letter the sixth.